Hey y'all, it is a cold and wet and gray and nasty day in Indiana. It's been like this for like two weeks now and I am personally on week three of my Corona quarantine. Um, I am not doing well. <laughs> um, it is not great. I am bored out of my goddamn mind. I am lonely. I have actually contemplated getting a cat. I don't like cats. I'm losing my damn mind. Um, and I thought that the way I could get over losing my damn mind is by talking about tarot cards, like one does. Um, and today I thought that I would talk about one of my favorite decks, which is my Dolores. And I, I, I mostly just want to show off the cards. Like this isn't like some sort of like massive like presentation that I want to do on Dolores or anything, but, um, Laurent, um, what was his name? Laurent William de Lawrence was a crazy SOB. Um, and he really, he, he drunk that occult Kool-Aid hardcore. He even had his own cult um, for a period of time. And the only reason I know about that is there's all these newspaper articles um, about a court case that had um, resulted out of it. I think the whole thing got started where he told a woman who was in the cult, who was also his employee, that she was fat. And she got like really annoyed with that. So she went to the police and told all the tales. And I don't think the police in Chicago actually would have cared, um, except that Dolores uh, had black people in his cult. And this is the 19, 1900, essentially. And uh, yeah, that didn't fly. That was only like, what, 40 years after the Civil War. So uh, they got involved because, you know, why is a white guy having a cult with black members? And that was, you know, the scandal of the times. So he was, he was a colorful figure for sure. <coughs> this is why I'm on Corona Quarantine. Um, and my last video about the MNL limited decks, I really came down hardcore um, on them for basically committing copyright infringement um, against U.S. Games' deck. Um, to me, it was very clear that they just scanned the U.S. Games deck um maybe did a color shift a really terrible one um and just passed it off and that's kind of more or less what the Lawrence did like as you can see these are just Rider Waite Smith cards right he took up the colors put in his own woo um and I think it's a little bit silly in a weird way that I was so condemnatory of the m and uh, M&A limited decks and um, love my Dolores so much. But part of that is the history of copyright in the United States. So no one knows anything about this. So I thought I'd t tell you a little bit about what I know. Um, to start things off, the, the writer deck that was published by Wait, illustrated by Pamela Coleman Smith and published by William Ryder and Sons Limited. That got started um, in 1909, <coughs> December of 1909. That was the Roses and Lilies deck. It was a problematic um, printing, so they recalled it for all intents and purposes. And later on in uh, 1910, they came out with the Crackleback Pam A. Um, L.W. DeLorentz came out with his deck in 1916. So he really only had about five years <coughs> where he um, got, you know, was able to discover the deck, figure out how to produce the deck, and shove it off into um, production and ultimately sales in 1916. Um, that's a really quick turnaround, especially for this time. Um, so he was really on top of that. And as far as I can tell, um, Ryder never sued him. <coughs> um, nothing was ever made of his massive theft. And part of that is because Dolores what did this at the tail end of what we call the cheap books movement in the United States. Um, basically, around the end of the Civil War, and by around the end of the Civil War, I mean the end of the Civil War, um, a lot of American publishers realized, well, shoot, like, we don't have, like, international copyright law in this country. 
why don't we just take all these books that are selling really well in Europe and just print them and sell them here? And that's pretty much what happened. Um, and I mean, the shoe kind of was on the other foot too. Like America didn't have like strong copyright laws that protected um, its authors, its producers um, in Europe. Um, I know Mark Twain was uh, a major um, advocate for changing those laws. And honestly, it's probably one of the major reasons why those laws got changed. Um, but up until honestly about 1900-ish, um, people were just taking stuff from Europe and reproducing it because there wasn't a strong basis of law that protected um, things across the Atlantic. Um, in Europe, the thing that kind of got this stuff underway was the Berne Convention, which um, started in 1886. This was basically a bunch of the European countries coming together and saying like, hey, we're going to recognize each other's copyrights, which hadn't really been a thing up till that point. And it did also establish like a development of international norms and copyright protection. I like to think of the Berne Convention as kind of like the European Union of copyright law. It's very important to realize that the United States was not a part of this at all until 1988. Over a hundred years later is when the United States finally bothered to put their signature on the Berne Convention and say, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna abide by these rules. That's a crap ton of time. Um, it's ridiculous. I can't, I, like looking back at history, I, I just don't even understand how this happened. Um, in the United States, what happened for us is in 1891, um, we had the International Copyright Treaty and that was an American law. Um, this said that, um, well, prior to this point, the U.S. copyright law only applied to American publications. It didn't apply to anything else. European authors couldn't pro profit, profit from reprints in the United States up to this time. And the treaty was supposed to help kind of change that and help protect international rights. It was not entirely successful and things kind of were a pretty gray area up through the middle of the 1900s. Um, and at that point, after World War II, there was a lot more um, discussion, a lot more um, trade between nations. And it was, you know, if, if, you, if someone published your book in a different country, you were more likely to figure it out um, pretty quickly than prior to this point in history. So those are the two points of law that really um, started the, the path to what we would consider um, copyright protection today. In the United States, um, we really didn't have a solid um, copyright until 1976 with the revision of the U.S. Copyright Act. And that really did get things um, squared away a lot more like they were in Europe. <coughs> And um, as you probably are aware, um, U.S. Games copyrighted the writer uh, Taro in 1971. That was even before the 1976 Copyright Act. So even if they had the copyright, it was harder to get things enforced. Um, and after the Copyright Act went through and things kind of settled and lawyers kind of figured out what things meant, Stuart Kaplan did actually go ahead and register things, but he didn't even do that until 1982. So things were a little bit uh, crazy on that end. Let me move these cards out. All right. Um, when we're talking about this deck, right, the DeLorean's Tarot cards, um, some of the best places for information that you can find on this deck do come from waitsmith.org. And if you go to waitsmith.org, you'll see that Dusty White has more or less established this timeline for the four modes of um, DeLorean's decks. He says that, hey, our timeline that we're looking for for the square yellow deck is between 1916 and 1935. Our timeline for the yellow, the round yellow deck is somewhere between 1943 and 1954. The orange published deck is between 1955 and 1962. And the red published deck is between 1963 and 1980. Um, these are really loose time frames that, um, so they don't like match up exactly with publication. These are just the time zones where historically based off of addresses, 
things could have been published. Um, and he doesn't make that terribly clear. So this is largely how he gets this timeline um, set up. Um, the square, um, the square edged yellow cards, they did get started in 1916. That's when they were first advertised in Lawrence's catalog. Um, they never had like an address or anything associated with them. Um, but we do know that DeLorence largely stopped producing them in the 30s, mid 30s. Um, later on, his son, Velo, um, took it over um, after his father died and retired and started producing the cards again. We're pretty confident that has to be after 1943 with around round um, yellow decks because all those boxes are stamped with the address um, 179 North Michigan Avenue, Chicago 1, Illinois. And the United States did not adopt the postal codes, the little one after a, a big city, until 1943 when all of a sudden they had to like change a lot of things for World War II and get efficiency going. Um, so any of the round yellow decks do have to be after 1943 because the, that postal address didn't exist until 1943. Um, any of the round yellow decks also have to be done and over with by 1954 um, because um, DeLorence moved their company from 179 North Michigan to 225 North Wabash sometime around there. Um, they stayed at 225 North Wabash for just a couple years. I looked that up in that phone book. Um, they are present at 225 North Wabash in the 1955 phone book and the 1956 phone book but they moved to um, 180 North Wabash in 1957 and they stayed there until they are there no more. Um, the only other thing that helps with addresses on timeline is the establishment of zip codes as opposed to postal codes. In 1963, the United States went to the you know five digit uh, zip code that we have today. Uh, technically, I guess we have a different zip code. We've got the five plus four, but that's that's that so that if we kind of like look at these dates all right we can see that they very much line up with those changes in address um so that's where they establish the timeline of the deck publication from but it wasn't like you know Dolores just flipped a switch and stopped um publishing decks in 1935. um i actually think that the timeline um, if we wanted to get into publications a little bit more, um, we do know that DeLorence started printing the decks in 1916, but somewhere in the middle of the 1920s, Ryder in uh, Europe, in England, had started exporting their decks, which were colored, right, um, to the United States. And I mean, if you think about it, marketing-wise, if you're, if you're buying public, has a choice between two decks, one that looks like this, and one that looks like this, which one are you gonna buy, right? Like you're gonna buy the one with color. Like that's just a no brainer, right? So I think that when Ryder started um, exporting the decks to the United States through various companies like um, Simplex, which was in Seattle, um, DeLorence probably backed off a little bit on publishing, on printing um, the square decks. Um, maybe continue to, you know, flog some back stock, but I don't think they like started, you know, producing a ton of decks. Um, that's just supposition on my part, um, based off of the fact that so few of these square decks ever pop up for sale. If they had been publishing like continuously for like 16 years, you would think that there would be more. Um, so I think it was just like a little bit of a flash in like 1916 to like 1925 ish or so. And then um, Ryder started um, putting their own decks in the US market. But Ryder did stop printing decks somewhere around 1935 to 1939. Um, basically World War II, right? You know, there were bigger things to do in Britain. And the plates, um, the lithographic plates that um, had been made for the decks um, were destroyed in the London bombings from what anyone can tell. So Ryder never started the decks up again. Um, and that I think is where Velo de Lawrence, um, 
Lauren, uh, Dolores' son, kind of like steps in. I, he, I think he realizes at that point, wait, no more of these decks are coming into the market. Huh, they're probably not making them anymore. Hey, we've got an open market again. And I think that that's why um, the Dolores decks started, you know, getting published again in, you know, World War II on. Um, we do know that Velo Dolores did revive the deck in 1943. Um, and that the deck largely did decline off when um, U.S. Games put their colored deck out again. Um, there is supposition that the deck did continue to be produced up through the 1980s, but I think that they were probably just selling off back stock that had been printed off earlier. Um, so that's my thought on the timeline of the Dolores deck. So I did talk a little bit uh, about these different phases of the deck produ productions how waitsmith.org says that there's four phases, the square yellow, round yellow, orange, and red. Um, just so everyone's clear on things, um, I go ahead and call these like deck one, two, three, four. And based off of what I've seen of the different decks, I kind of actually think that there's like five. So here's, here's basically how it breaks down. The first deck is the old one. It's the one published between 1916 and 1935. It looks very much like mine, right? It has that yellow and black coloration, but instead of these round corners that mine has, the corners are square. And mine has these like colored backs. They had just plain white backs. The box also had like no writing on it like this one does. It was just plain white, you know, basic. Um, and I think that this was largely being printed while the Lawrence was um, headquartered at 117 North Wabash. That's just a loose approximation that I have. I don't have that based off in any fact. My deck is the deck two. It's the one with the yellow and black coloration, but with rounded corners, an orange back with polka dots. Polka dots. Um, and then the box does actually say, the Lawrence tarot cards. It uses this Broadway font for the tarot cards, which they actually got from an ad that had been printed in the Occult Review. Um, so I think that's where DeLawrence actually picked that up. Um, an, an ad for one of the, you know, Pam D's, I guess. Um, so he, he stole that and revived it. Um, and uh, the address um, for the revival um, the first part of the revival was 179 North Michigan Avenue. Um, they did leave Michigan Avenue after 1954. But I think this yellow deck stopped publication fairly well before 1954 because the next deck, which I'm calling deck 3.1, um, does have some examples that were published at 179 North Michigan Avenue. This is a orange, a light orange deck. Um, I call it pumpkin orange. And instead of black outlining, the outlining is like this indigo, navy blue. There's a little bit of a shift in some of those colors, uh, depending on how thick the lines are laid down. It also has round corners. It also has an orange back with white polka dots. It also has a Dolores tarot cards box. And some of the boxes do have the same address, this 179 North Michigan Avenue. Um, and a couple others have the address of 225 North Wabash, where um, Dolores was for only a year or two. Um, I think that this was roughly like, I have 1955 there because that's when I know that Dolores was at 225 Wabash, but I would probably put it like 1953-ish. Um, and I would probably cap it somewhere on like, 1957, 58, maybe 1960, um, for the light, the light pumpkin orange color. Um, after that, um, once the Lawrence moves to 180 North Wabash, they still have an orange deck, <coughs> but the color of the orange deepens um, from a, this like light pumpkin-y, color to a deep tangerine red, reddy orange color. It does still have the indigo outline, so it's kind of an orange and a blue, which is really a pretty color, color combination. 
It also has the round corners. It also has orange backs with white polka dots. It also has a Dolores box. Um, some of these decks um, have a single like Chicago one address. Others have a five digit zip code, which means that these later orange red ones um, can't be published any anytime earlier than 1963. So if you've got a 180 North Wabash, Chicago, Illinois one box, it's gotta be earlier than 1963. If you have an orange red deck with a five digit zip code, it's gotta be after 1963. The final deck that DeLorence published was the deck four, where it is a very deep red orange. Um, depends on color and picture. Like some of them look straight up red, but I think most of them are actually more of a, a really deep red orange. <coughs> the line work is also that uh, indigo navy color. It has round corners, but it does have a color shift in the back. The other orange decks have a, a very pronounced orange back. The red decks have a, a much redder back. The red matches the, the red of the front. Um, it's also in a Dolores box. The only thing that changes is the address, which is, you know, the 180 North Wabash with the five digit zip code. Um, people have reported buying these decks in stores brand new up through the mid 1980s. Um, I don't think they were printed too much farther beyond 1973. That's my personal suspect on that. Um, yeah. Anything else I gotta say about that? Probably not. Um, if copyright interests you, um, I definitely recommend checking out the book, Copyrights and Copy Wrongs, The Rise of Intellectual Property and How It Threatens Creativity. Um, it's by um, a professor whose last name I unfortunately cannot pronounce, um, but he's currently the um, professor of media studies at the University of Virginia. And you can follow him on Twitter at Siva um, Vade, V-A-I-D. So, yeah, check him out. He's actually really cool. That's an amazing book that talks an awful lot about the complicated copyright history in the United States. Um, so that brings me to my deck, my baby, my one and only, my true love. Um, I adore, I adore this deck. I adore it so much. Oh, it's just so cool. And it's in great condition. Like, can you, like, there's, like, no dirt on those edges. You can, you can see the, the sheen. Everything is nice and straight. It's clean. I don't, like, I feel that these cards were almost, like, never taken out of their box. Like, the box is in terrible condition, but these cards are pristine. Ugh, they're so awesome. Um, and I just kind of want to flip through the cards. Maybe I should zoom in a little bit here so we can see them a little bit better. Right. Um, yeah. This little uh, black dot down here at the corner is pretty indicative of a lot of the yellow um, cards with the round corners. In fact, I've never seen a yellow card round corner that didn't have that little dot. I think that probably the, the plates or whatever they used to um, print these, the black work, just had a defect, a little scratch or something that let too much ink bleed through and it was probably too expensive to fix. And it's just, it's just a dot, right? Um, but you can kind of see how we've got the printings made up of all these little dots. Let's take a look down there. You can see like just how they were able to make all these neat effects with just two inks, um, just by changing the density at which they printed them. They're so cool. Magician. High Priestess. I love this Empress. Like this is such a busy card in so many ways, but because the ink colors are restricted, like different things pop. Like I almost always never see this little deciduous tree in the midst of all these poplars or whatever they are. Um, but it just like pops right on out there. 
I'm not distracted by the print of her dress when it's all just like one shade. <coughs> my, eyes, my eye is drawn to the Venus symbol and that little heart. Just a really neat way that that changes the way you look at the, the deck. The Emperor. <coughs> and looking at this card, like, one of the things I appreciate in the color version is that the little blue of the water at the base of those mountains does pop, and I would have completely missed it in this deck. You can see how it just like that little bit of blue in the water there just pops a little bit, but here you could easily overlook it. So there, there are pauses and negatives. It's one of the reasons why I like having multiple decks. With the higher fan, like when I see this card, the things that leap out are the crown, the keys, and the acolytes because those are things that are in that bright pop yellow. And to me, like those three things are the things that get to the root of what this card is. Um, so it helps focus like what I think the cards mean. The lovers. With this card, um, just because the, the angel here is in the same yellow as the sun, um, to me, like the eye isn't drawn there. It's actually drawn close to the, the relationship between the Adam and Eve figure. Um, and that's where my focus is. And that's where a lot of my reading comes from, just because I don't see this as readily without the you know crazy colors in the hair and stuff like that. The chariot. I think strength looks especially gentle um, when it's just in this like monotone with the yellows. The hermit. Hermit has hardly any yellow in it, so it just kind of looks cold and quiet and reflective and just focused on like a single thing as opposed to all the colors of life around you. Wheel of Fortune. Justice, like in the DeLorence, is one of my favorite justices ever. For some reason, I can see it really clearly. I'm not distracted by um, a background that looks about the same as what the figure's wearing, all sorts of things like that. Like, to me, like, it's just easier to see justice. Although I suppose I do lose the sword a little bit. man. Death. Like death has so much stuff that goes on in this card that I think the yellow and black kind of just makes things a little bit easier to see, even though this isn't a really terrible, terribly good printing. Um, you can see where like the yellow gets kind of brought into these uh, figures where the, like the, the plate just missed it a little bit. Um, like here you can most of the white that was supposed to be on that sail is down a little bit. You can see where, like, the crown kind of bled into the field, the bottom field here. So yeah, there was an issue with the plate, but largely, like, it's weirdly clear to see. Temperance. I love this double card. Um, the yellow throughout the entire thing is really, really soft, barely there. Um, and it's just the black, like, you know, it, it's especially monochromatic, even for a DeLorean's deck. And to me, this helps, like, show how much the two figures have yoked themselves to the idea of the devil, um, for what that means. Like, they see themselves as one and the same. They're not separate entities, that type of thing. The tower, especially dramatic. The star. It's one of my favorite stars. It's just the tranquil. I like it. The moon. The sun. Judgment. 
I like that the judgment doesn't have little zombie gray people at the bottom of it. That's always kind of irked me a little bit. And the world. Ace of Swords. Two, three, I love how like once we get through this like kind of like dark and you know restful associations how boom bright yellow bright yellow bright yellow and then kind of like that combination of the bright yellow and the gray again I'm starting to like get the down downhill slope of the swords and I love this one I love this one um to me like having that really oppressive yellow row 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 bar 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 it's just it, it feels weighty in a way that the colored version doesn't to me boom page of swords ah look like you can see the difference in the line weight and what a different energy that brings between the page and the night it's super obvious with this deck Hang on, where's my queen? I'm gonna have to look for her. Oh, there she is, I just flipped them around. There's the queen. And the king. I always think of this one as the come at me bro card, like, yeah, I've got it. Come at me, I dare you. I love how much the cat stands out. It's one of the few things on this card that is just straight up black, and here it just stands out so much. Kind of the same with his little salamander, I guess. Cups, I should probably pick this up now. Cups. I love this knight and I love to contrast it with the knight of swords where that one just has all that amazing bright yellow and the black and all that energy. This one just feels soft and reflective and just like I'm gonna go with the flow. This can always look so busy in so many decks, but here with the restriction of color, like, and probably not extending a ton of snow into the figures themselves, it's actually a lot easier to see. And you can kind of see like the connections of these pentacles with the tree that they're on in the stained glass. I 
actually a really good printing. Um, a lot of different decks, usually the ones that are based off of BC line art, kind of have a break in the scales here, and sometimes like like they miss this a second boot on this figure. But here, like you can even see where the boot is very cleanly divided. Like that's actually pretty cool. You lose all the, you know, detail in her dress. Probably because that wasn't like a block work thing. That was something that someone came in and did later with coloration. You can see though, like with some details here, that it was something that had been started by Pamela Coleman Smith. You've got a little flower there, a little flower there. It just wasn't carried through, through the rest of the dress. This card can always look so busy. And I mean, like it is a little harder for me to read the way it is here just because like it's harder to, to differentiate some of the stuff that's in this guy's um chair and cloak um but i can see his hand i can see the dogs it pops the kid it pops the the you know younger couple um in some ways it is easier for me to read even if i can't see all the detail I do kind of wish they had done something different here, like maybe made the bunny white or something. You kind of lose the bunny. The King of Pentacles. Right. That's my DeLorence. I hope you enjoyed seeing it as much as I enjoyed showing it. And I hope everyone is staying safe and healthy during the pandemic. Enjoy your day.